Welcome back to the Humble Marksman channel. I am on the range today training with world champion Travis Tomasi from Team Masterpiece Arms. Travis, how are you doing today? Really good. Thanks, Dave. It's, it's an enjoyable day and we're, uh, you know, really getting into it. The spring is almost here, so we're really enjoying ourselves. I'm in an open enrollment class with Travis here uh, with, I guess, 12 guys or so and uh, focusing on competition specific drills. Although, Travis, your background is not entirely in the competition space, correct? Yeah, I uh, spent some time in the Army, which was, which was an incredible opportunity. And I, uh, I actually had started competitive shooting prior to that. And it, it was kind of always my dream to be a part of the Army Marksmanship Unit. And I, I felt like I needed that experience for, as an instructor, as, a, as well as a competitor, to accomplish my dreams. And it worked out really good. How, how do you see the synergy of performance shooting you know for score versus real life combatives what was that like in the army i see and you know part of my job was was finding out what what you know what parables there are and what you could extract from competition and, and directly relate it to that and there's a lot there's target acquisition there certainly the fundamentals are there you always have to have that solid base um, and uh, transitions even movement so there's, you know, once you actually sit down and think about it, there's a lot of stuff that's relative. So one thing that has been really amusing, not amusing, that's not the right word, really interesting is uh, your class is not like a, an intro class. You very much have to be pretty much squared away fundamentally uh, to come and really get the most out of the class because it's not like we start with just the building blocks of it. Yeah. It's it's all about applied performance and one thing that was really interesting and i'm curious before we move off your background in the army is you're very interested in vision but also kind of the performance aspect like the kind of the mental side of the house do you think that there's crossover in those two kind of lanes or what, what's I, your experience there? i do believe there's crossover not in not only in like uh the psychology but as well as um you know being resilient and ultimately, confidence plays a role in, in, in both, both worlds, I believe. And having the, the confidence in your, your abilities, your marksmanship abilities. And so I see, I see a lot of crossover in that regard. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, the, the brain and how that functions, I think that there's a lot we can learn and take from it. As far as people who are maybe are watching this who are kind of new in their journey with handguns and all that kind of stuff, uh, what resources or what skills specifically would you say kind of should be focused on to develop to really kind of get going to begin to perform at high levels? So like in the, in the beginning and at a lower level, I really think you need to take the I call them, it's like the foundation, the essentials. More so than I call them basics, I want it to be essential. Your grip, your stance, uh, managing the recoil, and getting an awareness of the visual techniques as early as possible. And another thing I would, I would not shy away from, and I've noticed that a lot of people do this, is they, it's all, the, the mindset and the psychological skills involved in this people tend to put that off until well you know i'll make master or grandmaster and i'll wait till i'm more uh you know in a situation where i'm able to win but instead of differentiating or having it be separate you're one organism and i believe you need to start building the mindset as early as possible i would recommend you, know, you all of the drills the way your class is kind of structured is you're you're focusing in isolation for all the skills that we've been working on developing and a lot of times it's experiential like you will describe mm -hmm. what you're supposed to experience and then experience it so maybe talk about the relationship between the the light bulb getting turned on to the this is the only way i do this approach of learning yeah so so yeah like you said and the underlying theme day like you said is is isolation and the farther that I tend to, to, to break things down in my career, I've been doing this, I think it's 28 years now, since 95, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a mathlete, ladies, yeah, it's an athlete. Exactly, thank you, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, but the far, the, you know, the, the, 
I never stop looking for smaller pieces. And I like the idea of having a small part to work on. And in order to, my, my goal ultimately is to have, you know, awesome performance, awesome shooting. And, but I find that, and for a lot of students, breaking it down and isolating the pieces and letting them get a hold of that and letting them get comfortable and confident on that one piece and then start adding it together. I just noticed that it reduces the learning curve. And it also, also, I believe it builds like a stronger foundation. When you're aware of like we were talking about the visual properties of the transition, most people will never see that. Certainly I shot for years at a, I mean, I was winning matches, areas. Maybe I got into this before I won nationals, but I went up a pretty high level without being fully aware of all of the parts. And it's, it's it, so I'm curious which came first because your approach is very measured. Like you have data for every concept. It's not just like using grip as an example, although that's probably the one concept that where you are more nebulous because it needs to be. But I mean, you have the angle of the spine should be between this window of tilt in order to dump the recoil into the ground. The feet need to be 24 to 28 inches apart, you know, at this certain angle. Did you become aware of those in like testing that or you realized it was working and then you validated like, well, this is why it's working. Like, how did that process go? It was more, uh, that's a great question actually, because it was more, I found what was working well and then I dissected it. And it helped me, it helped me to make some improvements, even though I thought like the stance, I'm like, I got this down. Like this, you know, I'm standing this far apart, but I hadn't measured it yet. I hadn't quantified the angles. I didn't really know, you know, I, did, I hadn't broke it down to that extent, but I found something that worked well. And then, then I started to measure. And now I'm kind of a freak about that. And, and, and also from a, from a teaching standpoint, some people aren't attracted to that where other people are like, okay, I can go back home and I can make sure I'm on the right line and I can quantify it. Right. And, and, and it's, it's quantifiable. It's, 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 it's something that I can, uh, I don't need you. You don't need me there to check or diagnose. You, you can fix it yourself. And one of the things that was, I mean, this was, this was pure nerdery, but we spent about probably 10 minutes talking about it, but it, it was, it helped everybody understand what was happening. So in the class, we, I, I went ahead, I went around and looked in everyone's holster. We have nine optic shooters and three iron shooters, but we did spend time discussing kind of the mechanics of, uh, what would you call it? It wasn't a clue, not occlusion. What was the word? Uh, uh comp, not compensation. Uh, oh, accommodation. Accommodation. Yeah. The process of accommodation because every skill that we've discussed other than the, the the stance really has had a major visual component and just talking about how the eye works and how much time that all takes was uh interesting awesome <laughs> yeah it's it's just really uh you know I, I find it anything that i can any way that i can i'm always exploring and and learn trying to learn more about the the underlying mechanisms of what it is we do and how we can improve and if i also want to learn something new like as, as often as i can so that's sort of my approach i'm trying to teach myself so that i can do it better and then hopefully i can teach you better right well let's talk about that because you introduced a concept about the saccade i mean Share, share with the good people at home what a saccade is. Yeah, so the saccade is essentially it's the fastest movement that your eyes make. And it's a, it's a rapid movement from point A to point B. Anything over 30 degrees per second is considered a saccade. Anything under than that is pursuit or tracking. Um, what's interesting about it is, well, number one, we rely on this for fast target transitions. Fast target acquisition is a saccade. And what's really interesting to me, and I didn't know this till I broke it down, is that it's ballistic in nature. Meaning it's not, you know, guided as it's moving. It's not a radar guided missile. You, it's fired and it ends up where it's gonna end up. Those muscles and your eyes fire and it transitions to the next target and hopefully it transitions to the center of the A zone. But when we're shooting at a, you know, a high rate of speed and the gun is up on our, our, uh, on our sight line, it can be distracting and you don't really know how precise is that saccade? How precise 
is that visual mo movement. So that's why I really want to introduce it, but also isolate it. Right. Yeah. And that's, it, it's not exactly the same skill because right before that we were working on shot calling, but like the importance of observation, because like observation was kind of what you were pointing out with the, the shot calling, but with the saccade, it was the same thing because you were doing the demo and you were saying what you were seeing on the target, like describing in detail where your eyes landed on the target. And when you first got started, you were very honest and said, it's on the AC line. I'm not where I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that was, uh, I, I, I got a lot of value in the, I mean, you, you speak to the experience of, of what you're going for. Cause I think the deeper I go into this, the more I'm trying to focus on the sensations and feeling. And that's one thing I really appreciate about your instruction style is that you're speaking to all of the, there's tension here, but not this here. And so, uh, what's the relationship between transitions with the saccade and, and the observation of shot calling? Is there a relationship or am I making that up? Um, I, I think there is, and especially from the, you, you brought it up, the, uh, being an observer and observing and experiencing it. Uh, I think that is one of the key correlations. Number one is that not only that, not only observing and seeing the sight track and, and, and being aware of what a saccade is and what you're seeing when your eyes get to that next target, but you're processing it. And we're talking about how can we process this faster? You know, we have limitations that way as humans. So we want to keep it simple. We want to keep things, you know, re relatively linear. The subconscious likes a straight line. It likes repeatability. And so I think those are, those are correlations for sure. Just a couple little nuggets uh, from the class this morning, just that how mathematical Travis is with all of this. Uh, would you care, would you share with the uh, good people the formula you gave us for how hydrated you need to be to have optimum processing performance for all this vision that we're talking about? <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's basically you take your body weight and you divide it by 30 and that's how many ounces you should consume in, a, in approximately 15 minutes. And which works out for me personally, I'm up to about 200 pounds and it comes out to like 6.6 .6 ounces. So like you're at a major match, you're in your Texas, it's hot. I would like to see anywhere 25 to 30 ounces in the course of like an hour stage. But to add to that, it's not just pure water. It's important we get our electrolytes. You need at least your sodium, your potassium and your magnesium. And those neural communications, you spend all this time dry firing and live firing. Hundred, you know, uh, I don't know how much money you spent. We spent on this blood, sweat, and tears, and then to forgo being properly hydrated with those electrolytes and expect this. You know, some people call it muscle memory. Our right. muscle, yeah, our muscles never memory. It's neuron memory, <laughs> <laughs> right. and they need to communicate, and they rely on specifically uh, or particularly sodium and potassium. So that's got to be added to that equation to make sure you're you're staying you know well hydrated you also made mention you didn't you didn't dive into this but i'll ask you about it now is you mentioned that there is an optimum amount of uh, sleep for visual processing to be at its peak as well for you what what is that number yeah. is there a formula associated with it so uh, i can kind of i have an instinctive idea and i have to I wish I could get more sleep, I tell you, first of all. <laughs> I'm you always, and me both. <laughs> yeah, I'm always struggling with that. I'm always struggling. I would like to get I would like to get seven hours. Typically I get five to six. Um, we're, we're swimming in the same pond. We're swimming okay. <laughs> and I noticed that that's kind of like a you know, you're riding the line, a bare minimum there. When I get less than that, if it's three for certainly I, you can quant, you can essentially quantify the processing system in your brain. It's slowing down. Your visual processing is slowing down. It's not as accurate. Those saccades we talked about right. now that you've isolated, you'll notice a difference in where your eyes land on the target related to sleep, which is kind of a scary thing, but it's good to be aware of. Right. And, and to work on your sleep hygiene and, and prioritizing it, which can be hard with travel and life and spouses and kids, right, right. I understand all that. So another question, uh, the relationship between live fire and dry fire, you've mentioned dry fire. I suspect with the AMU, you got quite a round count under your belt when you were there. Yes, oh gosh, yeah, like a lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a yeah. golden ratio of like, 
you know, for each hour dry fire, you need to be hitting the range. Like, is is what have you found works for you? Well, well, we, I'll tell you. When I was in the AME, we had so much access to live fire, not just range time and ammo, that I didn't do that much dry fire at that point. Plus, I had established a, a fairly good uh, baseline. But um, that's a unique situation, obviously, right? You're not, right, right. Who that's has, that's who, one of the few professional shooters in the country. Basically. Literally, it is. It yeah. is. That, and that, and with that, with that man is going to the ammo bunker, grabbing a box of a thousand rounds, getting on the range with my training partner Max Michelle, and we'd spend the whole day shooting. So, as you can imagine, after that much, you put the gun away at night. You actually need some rest. Rest and recovery is important, not just in you know working out and building your body and your endurance but in shooting as well as cognitive as well, you can right. take a break. But these days where that's not an issue, I'm probably gonna do dry fire wise, you know, 50 times a reps that I would do for what, like 50 times of dry in fire. Dry to life. Yes, exactly, Got yep. Got it, and so last, I, I said it was last question, but for learning, you mentioned a lot of what you do sounds like it probably keys off of how learning sort of works. Like to optimize learning, like what should the training cadence be when you're trying to, you know, move the needle on your performance? So, uh, first of all, I mean, you need to, it needs to be, I go back to reps, sets, and volume. And I would say focus. And one more that's really important is intention. It is literally a psychological muscle it's a brain muscle and you need to work it and you need to leverage it um but i will work it look at it the same way doing and this is dry fire for example if we're working on a skill let's say we're working on the mag change i am going to do a number of reps a number of sets with breaks in between i'm going to make sure that i'm focused i'm not i don't have the tv on i'm not i don't have any distractions so that i can make these match quality uh i'm going to do that I would like to do it every day. I would like to see somebody doing that daily. Uh, you could take a day off. You could take the weekend off if you're making good progress. But I want it to be, it needs to be constant. When I started this, I was doing four hours a day of dry fire. Like, Whoa. yes, literally four hours of dry fire. At the same time, I was, I've felt the grip on your gut. I don't know that yeah. I want to hold that thing for four no. hours. <laughs> it's got enough friction that it yeah, hurts. Yeah, yeah. it's really, um, really spiky. It really is, yeah. <laughs> so that was too much. Plus, I didn't really have, uh, I was just going wide open at everything I did. I was so, you know. I know, I know a smarter way to go about it now, but I do believe you, you need to keep a constant, you need to be doing it constant in order to program those neural pathways and make those, establish those connections and then, uh, you know, pave that road, so to speak. Real good, real good. Well, if people want to take classes from you, where can they find you on the internet? Uh, TravisTomasi.com. And oh, you, it's all open enrollment classes. Do you do private as well? Or? I do private as well. Yep. Okay. That's right. All right. Well, Travis, I appreciate you sitting down with me. I look forward to the next day and a half together. So thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate <laughs> you. your head. And notice that your eyes are ro rotating counter, counter to the movement your head is making. So this is a VOR transition where I'm going to force you with a wide array to work this, to exercise this um, faculty that you have. So far, we haven't gotten into the VOR. This is where, this is the part of the uh, series that you're gonna do that. What this looks like, let me demonstrate. It's gonna feel awkward, guys. This is different than, because we're still doing one shot, it feels very different. Once you add multiple shots, there's something about, have you noticed when you add pairs that things sometimes become more intuitive? Okay, and the reason we're doing the singles is because I want you to keep isolate. You were, this is isolating right now, and you'll add to it later. So uh, eyes and ears, please. Okay, I'm gonna demonstrate, guys. This is a VOR transition. Uh, I'll do it right here. And this, this is the setup. The gun is on T1, just like we did on the second drill. The eyes are on T2. At the signal, you transition to T2, Acquire it, but do not shoot. Com do a turnaround back to the next target and then engage that target. So it looked like this. And you can separate these out even more.
the farther you've got to move, the more rotation your eyes are, are given that command from your ear, your inner ear. There we go, thank you. So I will go ahead and live fire. I start on T1, the gun, but my eyes are on T2. At the signal, I acquire T2, immediately go back to T1 and fire. Here we go. Okay, and then we do it the other direction too. It's awkward, isn't it? Thank you. Um, guys, if you're having issues not finding the A zone at first, that's sort of natural. You'll see what I mean when you get there. Your head motion is so radically being shifted and you're kind of like sloshing the inner ear to get back over there. Any questions on this weird thing? Okay. Why, why are you not shooting them? To, I'm assuming you're working this to work with the micro skill of and then fire one round to save ammo. I mean, do you work in skill without firing? True, true. It, exactly. Mike, it started, it started, it mainly was just I did not want the distraction of firing on T2 because I used to. And what I found is that I wasn't aware of as much of that saccade especially combining the saccade with the head motion. So, you know, you don't have to keep doing one shot, guys. It's like just experiential at this point. You're just seeing what it feels, because this feels really weird. I'll tell you, when you get up there, you'll see like, this is weird. Um, but that's a great question. Saves rounds, but mainly just because I don't want to distract you. Yes. So, you're holding on that target, looking at the second one. Yes. Going over and then transitioning back. To correct, okay, correct. Exactly. And then guys, down the road, you can change it where you stay on T1, go to T2, and then back to T3 too. But I found separating the mechanical from the visual initially is a little bit more enlightening in the beginning. So we're training the inner ear. We will do it one direction and then I will switch you up so you get a feel for both. We'll have uh, three shooters online at once, please. <laughs> 